My background basically is that I had two never events, uh, two, 20 years apart. One was a mistake, the other Sorry, one was not. Bring, bring the microphone closer Sorry. to you, or, or else you'll check with that. That's it, so. One was a mistake, the other was not a mistake. Uh, I've been coping very, not too, very well over the last number of years. I have had three experiences at A&E departments, uh, connected to, not connected to the original problem. And it was one of those in 1997 that uh, triggered me setting up AMNA with a number of other people, about 200 people in, in total, and we set up AMNA and we made a submission to the Human Rights Commission in 2001, where we met up with them for two meetings, which included about 24 people, and uh, we, we, we laid out what we were talking about. And the basic thesis was that people who are damaged by an adverse event are then punished, more or less, for the rest of their lives, because they're iatrogenic victims. And therefore, they are to be feared, to be uh, seen as hot potatoes, not to be dealt with, and that that's the real problem. And that's something we want stopped. So our main agenda is basically a duty of candor. And that is the, the, the main objective that we've had for, for all those years. I was also involved in setting up a European organization called Iatrogenic Europe Unite Alliance, set up in Utrecht, sorry, in Dormigan in 2004 and we issued a declaration. Uh, it included nine organizations from across Europe. Uh, briefly then, I'll move on to my own personal uh, problems with the A&E, and I'll take, I have three examples, but I'll take just the most recent one, which was in, in, fe in February 2010. Uh, I'm a fairly disabled guy, so I was doing something I should not have been doing. Uh, I had a fused light in an attic, and I got out a ladder, and the ladder had hooks on it, and I put the, the ladder hooks onto the attic trap door, and uh, what I didn't realize in the darkness, because I had a light failure, was that I put it the wrong way around. So when I mounted the ladder, the ladder slipped to the bottom, right down, I came right down, grabbed the, the opening with one arm, and uh, that didn't work, landed on the floor on top of the ladder with the, the bulb that I was replacing in the attic in my right hand. So that basically, I went to a, I, <coughs> Lay for about five minutes on the floor. My wife was there and my son, and they thought I was really very badly injured, and actually I was. Uh, <clears throat> so my wife, I said to my wife, uh, you know, I'll drive you to a local hospital, and I said, no, just take me on further. But she said, look, I, I don't want this at night time. I don't like driving at night, so I don't like driving motorways. So she drove me to a local hospital. I got to the local hospital. I waited uh, with my wife for about uh, half an hour. It was quite quickly. I was seen fairly quickly. And I, I, I had severe damage to my left arm. Uh, they kept, I, I saw this nurse, and uh, she said, oh, your elbow? I said, no, it's my arm. Uh, it's not involved in my elbow joint at all. And then the doctor came along, and he said, well, you know, what happened? So I explained to him exactly what happened. And uh, he, I think he, he uh, for some, he asked me then, had I any uh, numbness in my legs? And I said, no, absolutely not, because he assumed that I'd come down on my posterior, which I had done. And he said, uh, have you numbness in your legs? And I was on the point of saying, no, I don't have, but I do have. I've had numbness in my legs for 40 odd years. And I said, yes. Well, he said, what's the cause of that? And I said, well, I had two operations, lumbar operations, and I've been like this for, since 1971. But uh, he seemed to take umbrage at the fact that, I, that I, 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 he said to me, well, you had disc problems. And I said, no, I didn't have disc problems. I had two misdiagnoses. My problem was always my sacral spine. So he examined my back and down to my sacral spine, and, uh, you know, it, I said, yeah, I'm very sore down there. And then he sent me to, uh, to get an x-ray, but uh, to check if there were any breaks in my arm. And I said, no, I don't think I've broken anything. But at this stage, the, the, the atmosphere between us was pr pretty, well, combative, hostile. 
and I went into an x-ray. I went and had an x-ray on my elbow, which concentrated on this area, and uh, it came back with no, bro no breaks. And I didn't see the doctor after that at all. I saw this nurse, and she came in and she said, look, we're giving you a, a sling, and you, we'll, we'll put this on. She put the sling around my, th around my neck, and she lifted my arm up, at which I screamed, and she hey, said... We're going to give you one more minute, as we okay. said, five minutes. So. And <clears throat> so, to, to make a long story short, I mean, that is the situation. Uh, since then, I've, I've had extensive treatment to what, in fact, is a radiocapitellar injury, a, a torn uh, ligament in my shoulder, and uh, and those are still I'm still getting treatment for those. Uh, and I thought at the time when I was leaving the nurse said, I said, look, this is that I feel like I should immobilise this arm. And said, not at all, you'll be fine. In seven ten days you'll be okay. And I said, look, I don't think so. I think I should, you know, I should stabilise the arm. And she said, no. I said to the wife, my wife was outside, she didn't come into the, into the, uh, the, the uh, meeting with me, uh, and I think he, he kind of, the doctor at one stage said, well, is anybody with you? And I said, yes, my wife drove me here. I think he thought that I'd driven myself in some way. But anyway, my wife said, look, you're going to be okay. You're um, at five minutes, so just take us through what happened there. I mean, what was the well, after that, I mean, I've, I've had extensive treatment for years because I thought at the time that I was... I was mistreated because I was, in fact, claiming to be a, a victim of hydrogenic neglect, and that that coloured and, and, yeah. and, and, and tailored all that happened since then and after that, and that, in fact, that I was not getting treatment I should have been getting at a very early stage. And okay. as a result of that, I'm left fairly... Okay. I, no, I think I, I could go into that. I mean, if, if I'm picking up right, what, what you're really saying is that people who take an action at some stage for medical negligence, in whatever the circumstances that is, um, are then treated differently when they present to yes, emergency department. Yes. That's, this is a common thing. Yeah. I suppose there's two things. And you mentioned the duty of candor. So I suppose I have just two questions. One is, what do you think should be done differently by emergency departments to deal with this? What's your, what's your association's recommendation? And secondly, just to tell us a bit more about, you said that there should be a duty of candour. Can you tell me what exactly, the, again, the association has in mind when it asks for a duty of candour? So well, what, what, what is it that you think should be done differently by an emergency department? I, th I think if, if, the, if, if any doctor gets it wrong, it should, or any, any professional, health professional gets it wrong, they should own up to it, they should actually come completely clean, tell the victim, tell the family, and tell whoever, needs, whoever else needs to be told. By duty of candour, there is a professional duty of candour, there's even a contractual duty of candour, but it actually doesn't work. I mean, most of the time, doctors, I think, think of candour as actually uh, telling their colleagues or somebody up the line, but not telling the patient. There's no family involvement at all. And serious adverse incidents very rarely involve the family. The family are, are left out of the equation, and if you look at the, I, I know that you were talking earlier about the uh, the, pros, pr the protocols and guidance following a serious adverse incident, but if you look at the very you know the index ratio that they matrix risk register, you'll find that it doesn't mention the patient really. The patient is not included at all. It mentions all sorts of other. Uh, uh, professionals and administration staff, but the patient is not mentioned. And of course that document has been written and rewritten and improved. It's better than it was in the past, but it's still not satisfactory from the patient's point of view. What, what, I'm try what we're trying to do is to actually give the patient the same rights and the same power as the doctor or the health professional. And we're not looking to be competent. We, we, we don't want, uh, I haven't actually made a claim or anything. We don't want to be competitive. We want to, to have a collaborative relationship with the health, with health professionals. So that when I meet a health professional, I'm meeting on, 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 on the same level ground, and we have a, an honest conversation, and there's no hostility, and, and, and we proceed from there. And I think that's, that's what's missing, is this. And I think the other thing that's perhaps from the patient point of view is that the patient is disempowered because of the complete lack 
of information from the, that the patient has. I mean, I've had this for four, four and a half years now. It was originally, you know, tennis elbow, et cetera, et cetera, and then recently Rio Capitella. But uh, the, the patient uh, is disempowered in, in the sense of not having uh, information. I think every patient should have the same documentation that the doctors have. That's the situation in France, that they actually have the same documents. And every patient, nowadays, it should be possible to actually mini miniaturise a, a patient's complete history and, and have it there for them to look at. I was over on a three-day event in Birmingham where I attended the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and was very impressed with what they were doing. And I thought all other hospitals should copy that. The patients were completely in the, in the, in the, in the, in the in the mix, and the technology was brilliant in the sense that they had got access from any point in the hospital at a series of, uh, you know, any point of, con of uh, access, easily access, instant access to the, the patient's, uh, proceed to what was happening to the patient, and the patient himself or herself could also instantly access what was happening to them. Okay. In other words, they were kept in the loop and not left out of the loop. Okay. Also, they had, from my memory, they had a very good system for dealing with SAIs, a very open and honest system which worked. The thing about it is that patients and AMNA don't want to demonise, nor do we want to you know, terrorise or condemn doctors. We know they do a very difficult job in very difficult circumstances. What we simply want is for them to treat us with complete honesty. Okay. My second and final question that I'll pass you to, to Marion if she has any questions. You'd said that kind of your people are treated like a hot potato if they've been through yes. the kind of negligence or, or, or that. What, again, what, how would you <clears throat> remedy that situation? Um, what is it you would recommend? Or what, if you're to present next week, something happens to you again, what would you like to see done differently um, by an emergency department if you arrive in either yourself or a member of your family? I would like something in my notes to say that, that, that I am in fact claiming this with good cause. And I would like them to remove from my notes uh, the, uh, discrediting uh, statements. For example, my notes contain a reference to the fact that my son is a lawyer, which I find disgusting. They also contain a reference to my uh, personality. I suffer from personality disorder. And this is the kind of thing which is very, very damaging to patients. That, that you do this psychological labelling, as we call it, where we, we you actually destroy a patient by saying, look, you, you, mean, you, you can't be right here, this couldn't possibly happen. And uh, you must be imagining things. Uh, lawyers will tell you that there are loads of phrases which enter into the, the medical, the, uh, you know, medical uh, statements such as, for example, functional overlay, uh, personality disorder, uh, all sorts of statements, uh, sort of, um, for example, um, I'm trying to think of that. There's a whole series of them. No, no, I understand. I'm, I'm losing you're, them here. Yeah. You're really kind of saying there's almost like a code in your notes that somehow yes. suggests. There's a code on every set of notes. With this every person. set of notes that sure. refers to me has a code on it. As a? A code. Code, code. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're, that's really what you're saying, if I picked you up right. There's a guy, it's not saying Mr. Duffy is a troublemaker, it's, it's kind of code that people look at and go, oh, I need to be, I don't, I mean, it's yes. probably unusual to say, tell on somebody's notes to say what their sons or daughters do, for example, as a profession, you know, I don't suppose if your son worked in, I don't know, retail, worked in Next somewhere locally, that it would necessarily say your son is, uh, you know, well, the reference was on a lawyer, an obvious reference sure. to sure. Th no, I, that I, I pose a threat. Yeah. No, I understand. I and understand I pose it. a greater threat because my son's a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand the point. Marion, is there anything you want to ask? I have just two questions. Um, one, um, you've obviously seen your medical notes. Pardon? You've obviously had access to your medical notes. No. no. You haven't? No. Well, how do you know what it says in them? Pardon? How do you know what it says in them? Because, because I've, well, I've, I've accessed some of them. Uh, but your hospital ones, have you, have, you ever, have you ever accessed your hospital notes? Well, some of my hospital notes, yeah, but not yeah. all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, when I recently attended a hospital, 
uh, everybody has been seen within five, ten minutes. I was seen in two hours because my notes were missing. Now, nobody gave me an explanation as to why they were missing, and I think I'm not too sure. But that is the kind of thing that happens to all the people that we have. All medical negligence victims suffer in some way from that kind of, of actually attending somewhere and finding themselves being the last person there at the end of the, of the session, sitting there waiting to be seen. That's common. But the, the coded thing, I've seen it on at least four. So. And you haven't asked for your medical records to be altered? To be altered. Well, I mean, if, if, if there's information on them that isn't relevant to your medical treatment, like the occupation of your son. It's been taken off my GP notes. Yeah. Been taken off GP notes, right. Uh, but, I mean, I, I would have to uh, around quite a few hospitals to actually get the whole thing cleared. Right, right. And, and my final question is about the serious adverse incidents. You, know, um, you were saying that while there's changes in the policy and that the patient has to be involved. There's yes. no change in the matrix. Well, the, the, is, the, is, that, is that? The matrix is, is, is it's, it's based on a New Zealand model, I presume, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been altered. Originally, it was very actual brutal, and when people come on to talk about risk management, but the meant was managing the risk to themselves, not to the patient. So the risk matrix register means managing the risk to the administration, the trust, the hospital, the doctor, but not to the patient. Right, I see and what you that, mean. That's the fundamental problem with, with that, with the SAIs. Yeah. Uh, you have people, I mean, the SAIs are taking place, uh, good RCAs are taking place without families being involved at all in follow-ups to SAIs. But they're investigated without the family actually knowing or even knowing the result of the investigation. And that that's taking place. I know that should change with the revised policy. Pardon? That should change with the revision to the policy, which is now saying... It should change, yes. Patients. We should have yeah. a completely open system. Right. Uh, it, it operates in a lot of walks of life. It's, it's only in, in medicine that we have this kind of thing of, of, uh, of denial and cover-up. It doesn't happen in other areas of... Well, maybe it does in some, but not much. It also is, is, of course, medicine is one of those areas where if you make a mistake, somebody might die. Uh, if you make a mistake as a teacher, as I was, you know, people would die, they might, you know, fail an exam or something, but they mightn't die. Uh, so it's, it's one of those areas where you've got to have total openness and total honesty. And I think that any of the documents that we put through are saying that. And any of the... Any of the we, we, we've... If you look across the world to uh, the WHO document of 2005, where they're asking for an end to the denial of cover-up, or if you look to, to, uh, to for example, the, the, the Charter of Patient Rights in Europe, you'll, they're asking for the same thing. So when it's a common thing, uh, as part of that, that IE alliance, we, we met up with, with the, with the uh, Director General of the Cohesion Unit in, in Salzburg, and they already have done a series of fora papers on this, so they've actually looked at it in detail. And there are countries across Europe that have actually solved this problem. You know, countries like Denmark or Norway, and you have groups out there campaigning, like the Rosenberg Group. And uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult one to tackle. I'm, I'm not saying it isn't to have total disclosure. It's difficult, but it has to be done. If, if you don't do it, there's no point talking about anything else. Thank you very much, Eamon. Thank you. Okay. Paul, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank you very much, and uh, those comments in particular on the, the duty of candour were most interesting. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for Eamon, Eamon, just to say, finally, as we've said to everybody who has appeared before us, um, if you want to augment um, your evidence by submitting anything to us, you're very welcome to do so, um, and we will then be happy to, to accept that. And thank you for a short notice giving your evidence this afternoon. It's really useful to get to get that um, perspective and, and an understanding of of what's happening to to uh, patients in your situation.